They say poker is a hard way to make an easy living. This is the podcast about people that make poker work for them. This is Mid Stakes Living. Hello, everyone, and welcome to a brand new episode of Mid Stakes Living brought to you by TournamentPokerEdge.com. We are back from the World Series of Poker, and that means, yes, it's time to start recording more episodes of Mid Stakes Living. As always, I'm Derek. I'm joined by my co host, Matt. How are you, Matt? Very well, Derek. Very well. How are you doing? I'm doing good. Uh, barely recovered from Vegas, but I'm getting there. How about you? Yeah, pretty much the same. A little bit jet lagged. I flew in yesterday and already on the podcast grind. So uh, back to work, I guess. Now that we're back to reality, but um, it was a fun summer. So uh, it's it's good to be back on the online grind. Bit of a mix it up. Yeah, for sure. How did you? Um, I know that was your first sort of full summer in, in it was, Vegas. Yeah. How did it go? It was. It was. It was a lot of fun, and I learned a ton. But I ran terribly. Um, so it was <laughs> kind of in results terms, it was not great. But I would imagine that. What I gained in EV from everything that I learned probably offset what I lost in actual money. So I'm pretty I'm pretty okay. With it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Well, it was definitely a. Uh, it was one of the hotter summers I can remember in oh my, God, my time of the World Series. Seriously, so, as yeah, a, it was it was brutal. As an incredibly fair skinned person in a in a desert country or desert area. Um, I I basically <laughs> didn't go outside all summer. So yeah, it was not not a lot of fun for me in that front. But yeah, it was it was hot. Cool, cool. Well, uh, enough about us. Let's get back into uh, what we're all here for, a little podcast. Absolutely. Uh, so, yeah, so why don't you introduce our guest? Really excited about this one. Yeah, for sure. Today's guest is Matt Berkey. You guys may uh, have some familiarity with him over the last few months from the uh, Super High Roller Bowl back in, I believe it was late May or early June. You might correct me on that, uh, where he finished fifth place um, for a seven-figure score. Um, and he's also been pretty active uh, this summer on, on the sort of poker section of social media, a lot of a uh, lot of buzz going around about a couple of interviews, at podcasts, and some blog posts of his that have blown up a little bit. So uh, we thought it'd be great to get Matt on and uh, talk about a lot of stuff. Um, he has a pretty interesting poker story, and I think certainly this is probably the uh, the first instance where mid stakes living kind of becomes high stakes living because I think Matt plays pretty high stakes a lot of the time. So that should be an interesting conversation as well. So welcome, Matt. Yeah. Thanks to thanks to you for coming on. Good to have you, have you on the show. Thanks for having me, guys. Excellent. Cool. So yeah, so a good a good place to start is probably since we are just fresh off the World Series. I know Matt, you were out there playing a lot of events this summer. How did uh, the World Series of Poker treat you? Uh, it was. Way too long and way too short. <laughs> um, I had a fair summer, I guess. Uh, it was the biggest summer I played as far as like volume and buy-ins went. I played full schedule. I uh, had about 200000 worth of buy-ins plus another 50 k or so of action that I bought. And wow. uh, I think I lost around 70 k so it could have been much worse is what you're saying. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. Uh, I, I played a handful of cash and made a bunch of money there. So uh, definitely no complaints. But I felt really good going into the summer, especially springboarding off of the super high roller ball. So I had really high expectations. Uh, I think in a lot of summers in the past, I thought I was capable of winning a bracelet. But this summer, I like almost expected to. Which is, right. You know, uh -huh. You're not oh. in Yeah. Let's uh, let's talk about the super high roller ball to start off with, just because I, I, what I think is really interesting is uh, I, I was doing a little bit of research about uh, about your uh, your background before we uh, before we started off, and um, looking at your Hendon mob here, um, I, you, as far as I'm aware, have have been a cash game pro for for the majority of your career, but it, it's interesting to me that you you have almost three million in uh, live tournament winnings, and uh, you're actually I don't know if you're actually aware of this, but you're 359th on the all time money list. So for a cash game pro, that's pretty impressive. So uh, talk to us a little bit about the decision to, to jump into a, a big tournament like that and how your mindset shifted from, uh, from the cash game grind to, uh, to a big 300K buy-in. Um, all right. So the decision to play was really easy for me. Um, okay. You know, when, you start playing, when you start playing nosebleeds, it's just tough to drum up action, really. And right. when a company like Poker Central presents an opportunity where they're going to put a tournament up uh, of that magnitude 
with negative rake, it's just like, you know, first and foremost, I'm a professional poker player. And mm -hmm. when someone's going to provide me that level of value, I'm going to find a way to adjust to it and try to capitalize on it as best I can. Right. Um, so the decision to play was quite easy. The, the pressure I put on myself to train and perform in that event was a lot more stressful. Uh -huh. Um, it's the first tournament that I've ever actually spent months preparing for. Like, you know, usually it's, you sit around and think about your game a little bit and develop a, a reasonable strategy and then just implement it over hundreds of events. But, right. uh, this one's a little bit different. Like the structure was different. The fact there was only 49 entrants was different. And the fact that there was film on most of these guys made it something where I thought I could do something, uh, on the intangible side of things that no one else in the event was likely doing. Mm -hmm. So with, with that, did you, do you mean to say that you, had, you spent time reviewing footage from all these players and actually preparing how to tackle each individual guy? Yeah. Uh, you know, I have a nice small group of friends who are all willing to like invest in one another. And, you know, they were very quick to just be a part of it and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, put, a footage reel together, help study with me. Uh, you know, just basically treat this event for what it was. It's kind of like a black salon occurrence. Like mm -hmm. this just doesn't happen that often. And the opportunity to play is pretty rare. So it's no different than making the main event final table and having a couple of months to study and prepare for a, a nine handed sit and go for $8 million. Like yeah. you just do it. You find ways to do it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Interesting. That's, that's fascinating. Cause I, I know a lot of tournament players would, uh, would love to be able to go into each tournament with enough information about their opponents so they could specifically do that. So it's a really different uh, mindset to almost any other tournament, I suppose, with the field being so small. Um, did you did you find that there were maybe some similarities there with the way you might approach playing against cash game players that you play against regularly? You know, you were having like really specific reads or was it more of a general kind of a, how am I going to sort of adapt a little bit? Right. Uh, well, all right, so... I guess first I knew that I was a relative unknown in the field and that uh -huh. I'd probably just be glanced over in a lot of scenarios. So yeah. it was kind of figuring out how we could use that as an advantage as well as like understanding a lot of what uh, these opponents that I don't have much familiarity with are doing, guys like Fedor and, you know, the GTO subset of guys, if you will. Right. Um, so I put a lot more work into uh, – further understanding GTO beyond the little bit that I had studied up until that point. And yeah, we basically just like after reviewing the footage and getting a feel for people kind of like lumped them into either the GTO category or exploitive. And if they were exploitive, it was kind of like finding trends, finding little things that they do, trying to pick up on physical tells if there are any, uh, whatever the case may be. It's like, you know, over the course of a lot of hands, it's kind of impossible to hide, uh, the little nuances that, um, can translate his weakness. And that, that goes for me too as well. But I know there's no footage of me out there. So it was kind of like, I definitely have an edge, even if guys are doing this. That's yeah, that's interesting. That's the way that, oh, sorry, carry on Derek. Uh, yeah, I was just going to say, that's really interesting that you actually took it to that level. And I'm kind of curious, like you said, there was no other footage on, or there was really no footage of you out there for them to, to research you. But do you think other people put that much work into researching everybody else in the field other than you? No, I genuinely don't. Uh, most of those guys are accustomed to playing these stakes when it comes to MTTs. They all have their own strategy that they think is already winning. And it's just a matter of like showing up, implementing, and moving on. Uh, I think especially guys who translate from a, an online background just still see it as applying volume. Um, but when you come from the live world like I do, I think you understand how much more unique each and every moment is and how much more like life-changing it can be. Because... I don't get to play that tournament a thousand times. I get to play it once in this exact moment. And it, it kind of garners that certain level of, of understanding and respect that, you know, just playing the hundred rebuy every day for three years doesn't. Mm -hmm. um, so there are like, or at least there were certain exploits that uh, I plan to understand that I was utilizing and employ in the moment because it doesn't matter having having balance in these spots is just pretty irrelevant in the short run. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I, I think coming into that tournament, I imagine it's a pretty unique scenario, 
not just for for you as an individual in that this is the this is the only time when you get to be the guy that nobody knows about i mean until obviously like if, if you if you play against different people next time sure but like let's say if you were to play the event again next year presumably a lot of the same people would be there and presumably they would subsequently have some kind of a read on you based on the way you played this year but going into it for the first time um you know not only are you the kind of the person that nobody really knows much about but also um this is the you know it's it's only the second time this tournament's ever happened so it's it's unique in that sense that you know it's just one of those tournaments that even if this tournament happened every year um for you know from now on nobody would ever be able to get to a sample size of more than about 50 tournaments in in that if they played this the super high roller every single year for their entire life and so you can't even hope to to try to play in a way that relies upon the long run panning out in in some kind of favorable way and you 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 almost have to to look at that you have to kind of come back around to that sort of how do i win this hand right now kind of a mentality is that a fair judgment yeah absolutely and i think it uh, i think that extrapolates over to like pretty much all of live play i it, it's a little different because this is one specific unique tournament but yeah. even whenever you go further into volume of like say a cash game and say it's the exact same lineup every day for a few years or say three times a week for a few years so like a hundred a hundred times a year you're playing with the same lineup it still takes such a long time to see any sort of long term that um playing a mixed strategy rather than gto is just going to if you're good obviously and if you're if mm -hmm. you're aware and and you understand like uh presenting balance rather than actually being balanced things like that mm -hmm. you're going to find way more money in the exploits than you are in keeping yourself protected because quite frankly no one else is that good uh and again like myself included like when you're talking about the highest level guys nobody is so good that you need to make a bulletproof strategy where they can just never see through you in in exchange for passing on the exploits mm -hmm. yeah I, I think that makes a lot of sense uh and i think uh one of the interesting aspects of this whole kind of uh concept here regarding only being able to play a certain tournament once is obviously there's there's a lot of variance in there um and this is a nice little segue because we get to we get to steer a little bit away from from veering too much towards the whole strategy of the gto versus exploitative and we can talk a little bit about the idea that uh, a three hundred thousand dollar buy-in tournament is is a hell of a lot of money and um i'm curious how you approach playing for those kind of stakes because i know that's something that's not uh, alien to you so it's uh it's a mentality most of us never get to experience so so talk to us a little bit about what what the money means in that context and how you adapt to, to playing that high um yeah it's it's uh it's a really strange phenomenon with me but i'm i grew up really really poor mm -hmm. and uh just having spoken with some people who like are a little more knowledgeable from I guess the psychological side of things and, and uh, have an education in that background. Uh, it's, it's no shock that it's easy to jump to the conclusion that people who d grow up very poor tend to be incredibly like strict and conservative with their money. Mm -hmm. um, but I just think there are certain outliers like myself who just basically develop this entire detachment to it. Like, I know what the worst case scenario looks like and I thrived through it. So this is just a means to function through life in a simpler fashion. And uh, I think whenever you begin to find like the value in yourself, it's a lot easier to just default to not fearing the worst case scenarios of, of risk because, mm -hmm. you know, you can just always find a way to, um, to utilize your skill sets and turn them into uh, some sort of monetary gain. So like for me, all the way through the come up, I've never been rolled for anything I've done. Literally. <laughs> I mean, this is like the first time in my life that I'm, I'm rolled to be doing what I'm doing like, and I'm being relatively smart as far as like diluting my action and selling and, and things along those lines. But uh, yeah, for the 300K, like I bought way too much of myself because I felt so invested in 
uh, how much work I was putting in, and it wasn't going to break me. It was like one of those mm-hmm. things where, like, you know, if I'm following bankroll guidelines, like, I probably should be risking more than like five percent of myself. And I'm just like, you know what? Uh, I don't really have any fear of putting up twenty percent of my bankroll here in this one event where the variance mm-hmm. is really high, and I'm unlikely to cash. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. Um, and I think it just becomes like a big motivator too. Like you see, like what Jay did this summer, uh, Mercier, where he just makes like heaps of bets on himself, and it's just one of the things that drives him. Like mm-hmm. I'm not shocked at all at the success he had, mm-hmm. and I'd be more shocked if he maintained that level of success had he had zero bracelet bets. Uh huh. Mm. Yeah. That's, yeah, that's pretty interesting. Like basically, the the idea that he just essentially financially in, uh, incentivizes himself to grind and play well, yeah. stay healthy, all the, all everything else. Yeah, it's like you build a certain callus, and like for me, it's different because like I'm impervious to the risk. But like for guys like Jay, who are just killing it at such a high level and are just so well off that like they're never really going to play stakes where where they're at risk. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's a it's a way to feel it again, right? Like it's it's a way to give yourself that sensation of just getting into the game and feeling a little bit of the financial pressure and uh, kind of rush when it comes to winning. Because mm-hmm. you know, when you reach a certain level of success, you just kind of become numb to it all, and losing hurts so bad, and winning is you're just so indifferent to it all. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. It kind of makes me think of a kind of an interesting question that I wanted to ask you, which is obviously playing 300k buy-ins. Um, is it hard? Because I saw that you you know you cashed a bunch of 1500s. Is it hard to go sit in a 1500 dollars tournament after playing a 300k? In the past, it definitely would have been. I've I've just put like so much work in the last three or four years to like the psychological and mental game uh, aspect of poker that I feel like I've finally become, uh, I guess like heightened in focus with that stuff where I understand that it literally is just a strategy and I'm just sitting down and implementing it every single time. So in the past, uh, there've been times where I pressed because I was financially strapped or because the binds were just incredibly like way too small. I'm playing 300, 600, 1200 no limit. And then I'm going to play a one K at the world series. Like mm-hmm. stuff to care. <laughs> it's like a one big yeah. line buy in. <laughs> right. Right. But when you start to understand that, like, you know, you're playing it because the value is really high. And if you just sit here and, uh, you know, implement the strategy the same way a coach would in, uh, a sporting event, then you should win. Maybe not at the level that you want, where you're just, racking in bracelets but nonetheless you should see some of your expected value and it's like once you kind of put it in those terms and you understand like this is the professional aspect of things this is the living we chose to do and the world series only comes around once a year like get excited for it get out there and and just embrace the grind Mm -hmm. yeah for sure you mentioned the you mentioned the mental game aspect of things are you working with like a mental game coach or are you just doing a lot of work on your own or how's that work for you uh so in 2012 i went broke for what i swear is going to be the last time (laughs) Um, and uh you know my days i've always been a little bit like i guess uh off the beaten path with the way i think um, so the concept of self actualizing wasn't really a difficult one for me. It was always something that I kind of had in the background of my mind, but when I went broke, it was very easy to just like push it to the forefront. So I always understood the, the need for life balance. I always understood why I chose this profession. It's like, I wanted the independence. I wanted the ability to, uh, do whatever I wanted to do day in and day out. And a lot, in a lot of ways that was just creating uh, some structure around eating well and lifting and, you know, maintaining healthy relationships with friends and family and whatnot. Uh, mm. When I went broke, all of that got pushed to the forefront. And it was kind of like trying to devise the areas where I've been lacking for so long. And uh, it was tough. I mean, when when you're just not sure of yourself and your ability and whether or not you're you're going to pull through to the other side, uh, but you're still of the mindset that you're incredibly good and too proud to, to ask for help. 
it really puts a massive weight on your shoulders to to pick yourself up and move beyond the the like downside of going broke. So like my days were I would wake up and I would drag myself to the couch and I would put on like how I met your mother or some other trashy sitcom <laughs> and I, I would just like immediately nap because the concept of having to not pursue my career for another day uh, was just very difficult. But eventually like I would wake up, I would eat, I would hit the gym, I would do all the little intricate things that would like give me some positive momentum and then I would just grind. And I mean, like, not in the sense of playing, but just tearing myself to shreds and figuring out, like, all the the deepest, darkest areas that I'm lacking and, like, why I'm not a good friend, why I'm not a better grandson, why I'm not uh, a winning poker player at this point. Where did it all go wrong? And uh, throughout the course of all that, I just kept getting little opportunities to, to pick myself up and dust myself off. And I was, you know doing well enough where I was paying the rent, but I still had zero dollars to my name um, until (laughs) like I finally broke loose. I just had like an opportunity where a good friend lent me 5k. I finished like fifth in a tournament uh, for 25,000, sold some action to the world series and ended up having a half million in scores and like basically never looked back. Uh, (laughs) So since then I understood the importance of it all. And to, (laughs) to answer your question in a roundabout way, I reached out to Trisha Cardner and mm, yeah. worked with her for a short period of time. And she suggested that I actually work with uh, Elliot on a much uh, more intense level. So uh, Elliot and I have been working together for around a year. Very cool. Yeah, I've heard a lot of great things about Elliot. Uh, we've had him on the show and I mm-hmm. uh, really, really like um, everything I've heard about him as a person and as a, as a mental coach. So they're that's both, very cool. Yeah, Absolutely. Both I've, amazing. I've, I've done a couple of sessions with Elliot myself, and I can certainly vouch for, for how effective his, his work is for sure. And I know he's worked with guys who have made something like – I have some crazy amount, like $18 million worth of caches at this summer's World Series or something crazy. So um, <laughs> yeah, not $18 yeah. million, like some, some amount of millions. Um, so yeah. Elliot, I think, is fast becoming the go-to guy for a lot of people at the, the high levels. Yeah, he was definitely a big integral part of uh, making me feel as good about the 300K as I did. Because uh, if nothing else, like even when we're not like working on the mental aspect of the things, just him being able to find the small points where I might have a little self doubt and being able to be a little bit of a cheerleader is just like massive. But uh, you know, we did hypno before every single day of the the actual event itself, mm-hmm. and by the, by the time I got there, I just felt like a stone cold killer. <laughs> um, it's I, I just I highly recommend it to anybody who's like on the cusp of of doing. I mean, when I when I went to Trisha, I was on a five and a half million dollar downswing in the big game, and by the by the end of uh, the super high roller bowl, I was you know approaching getting out of makeup. So that's less than a year's time. Yeah, that's pretty amazing. It also makes my downswing seem really, really small. <laughs> it's, it's certainly all relative because most of that money was not mine. <laughs> Fair enough. I think the so. The thing, uh, sorry, Derek. Go, oh, you go, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to ask a little bit about um, to kind of just jump back a little bit. I mean, obviously, you started out as more of, or from what I understand, more of a cash game grinder than a tournament grinder. Yeah. Um, it, do you kind of go back and forth now, or do you consider yourself more one than the other at this point, or what's the kind of game plan? Uh, I've always been cash first and foremost. I probably always will be as long as uh, it continues to exist. I had like one small stint in my career where uh, I wasn't doing that well financially, and I was living with Brent Hanks at the time, and he backed me online. And uh, so it was like the end of '09 going into 2010. I played for roughly six months straight as a relative unknown online and I just crushed, but it was the lowest point of my career. It was 12 hour days every single day. And I hated it with a passion. (laughs) I was so happy. It it all culminated in me getting second in, uh, the FTP, uh, 750 K back then, or I actually chopped, uh, and it was my first six figure score. And the second it happened, I like didn't play online for months, huh. and then I never played beyond just like 
you know, F top scoop, whatever. And Sundays, like, and I never wanted to, again, I was one of the few people who was like celebrating black Friday. Like, Oh, it's great. <laughs> All these guys are going to have to move into the live realm. Cash games are just going to flourish. Like I'm just <laughs> reaching the pinnacle of my career here. Unfortunately, like the money getting locked up was, was pretty detrimental, but uh, yeah, I recognize that there's a lot of money to be made in tournaments. Again, I said, you know, I'm a poker player first and foremost, so I'll always go where there's value. But my main study, my main focus, where I feel like I'm strongest is always going to be cash. Cool. That makes, Very makes cool. Sense. I guess the, uh, the the live cash games aren't in danger of drying up anytime soon. God, I hope not. They are, <laughs> uh, they're a real dream. <laughs> well, everyone's all everyone's all doom and gloom about the uh, the cash games on the uh, major online sites these days. So, who knows? Maybe live will be the uh, primary format for cash games moving forward after a couple more years. Yeah, I I actually like. I mean, I might be getting what I was hoping for when Black Friday came around. To be quite fair, like, uh, it's not that I think that the guys playing online cash are bad. It's quite the opposite. I think they're some of the best and some of the brightest, mm -hmm. but. I also think they're some of the proudest, which is incredibly beneficial because it slows their learning curve in live. They're just pretty unwilling to accept that GTO doesn't necessarily translate directly. Uh, it obviously has a massive uh, foundation, and it's, it's a good thing to default back to. But when you sit in these games four, five, six hundred big blinds deep, and you just stare people in the face and understand, like, yeah, I'm at the bottom of my range on this river, but he's just not folding because he's improperly top heavy. Uh, I'm just going to have to give this one up. It's so much better than just like punting off hundreds of blinds that are going to take you forever to recover. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think that a lot of people don't necessarily recognize the extent to which one mistake like that can cost you so much that it takes you such a long time of, of winning at a certain rate to, to actually get back to where you had been if you just made a better decision in the first place at that point. Yeah. You know? So it's easy to lose track of that when you're playing 5,000, 10,000 hands a day. Um, but, but when you only right. play you know, 25, 30 hands an hour for a, a five or six, six hour session, it's, it's important to get every decision exactly right. You know? Yeah, yeah. I think it's the mentality of like pressing small edges and mm -hmm. not recognizing that uh, those small edges are effectively worthless when the other edges you can create are just so massive. Uh, like, you know, I, I'm very open about the fact I'm the worst preflop player you'll ever come across. <laughs> but I don't care. Because it, it just garners me action. It gives me, uh, it gives me a gambly image. People think I'm giving them a, a lot more action than most others in the game. And I'm basically just like sacrificing small amounts of EV early in hands in order to gain huge edges post. And the mistakes that I'm getting guys to make are like for hundreds of big blinds versus like the the five to 15 that I'm making a mistake with pre. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's an interesting concept to, to compare the two there. I heard um, I heard another podcast where you were, you were talking to Elliot and Trisha actually on their podcast and you, mm -hmm. you kind of mentioned the idea of incorporating this concept of, of everybody having their own pain threshold for playing live cash and that I, I found a really interesting idea. Um, so, so tell us a little bit about how that influences the, the way you approach cash games. Yeah. So, uh, you know, especially coming from a, a cash background in the majority, uh, speaking live venue stacks get really deep. And uh, I think that's like one of the most dismissed things about people running around saying that like no limit hold'em is solved. It's like uh, maybe in its simplest form, but certainly not as you begin to change the variables. Um, and with these stack depths just come like levels of discomfort that people are willing to risk for. You know, we kind of talked about it earlier where uh, it, it takes a, a certain level of sickness to just desensitize yourself to what it is you're actually risking. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, just through human nature and the fact that the majority of us are all the same and we understand that, like these pressure points kind of create themselves. Somebody may sit down with the mindset of like, I'm willing to risk 500 big blinds in this game, um, but they may not be willing to do it all in one hand. So suddenly if they find themselves into the game for 500 big blinds and they're up a little bit, so say they have six or 700 big blinds in front of them, and then all of a sudden they're put to a decision to play for it all, it's really, really difficult to make the proper decision in that moment. Mm -hmm. um, 
And I just think that this is something that I've been very good at, at being able to navigate, uh, you know, by familiarizing yourself with the human element of live games, you're able to kind of see through a person and recognize like where it is that they'll actually crack. And now uh, you just kind of like take a couple of these negative EV uh, early spots in order to create much larger positive EV ones down the line as, as runouts favor you um, and the pot begins to swell. So, you know, it's it, on the surface, it just looks like I'm gambling a lot more than everybody else. And that's a skill set in and of itself. People appreciate it. Uh, I, I get invited mm-hmm. to these games, particularly because of the action that I drive. Um, but the, the real way that I'm recouping off of that is just finding ways to win the biggest pots and, and putting people into a fight or flight mode or a fit or fold mode, I guess, from a poker standpoint, just because the hand's kind of gotten away from them. It's, it's gotten to a level of unco- or discomfort. And it mm-hmm. all starts pre with me. If everybody else is opening 3x, I'm opening 5 to 7. Uh, uh-huh. And it's like, yeah, I'm probably giving up something there on, on the short term, but I'm making up for it for sure elsewhere. Yeah, it's like you said, you might be giving up a little bit pre-flop, but if, I mean, if you open to 7x and someone calls, the frequency that they actually bother to bluff you post-flop is going to be like almost zero compared to when they're just in this little bubble that they like to be in of playing a three X raise pot. And, and it's something they've done a hundred times, you know? So yeah, I can yeah, totally see the value there. Yeah. It's literally just taking people out of their comfort zone and moving them to fit or fold as quickly as possible. Whether that's by opening large three betting high at a high frequency, uh, cold calling three bets four betting, whatever it is, just all the things that like you're not going to see in a standard hundred big blind online game, because those people are just prepared to, to do what it takes to navigate the, that field at those depths. Mm-hmm. Um, but like, there's so much more ego involved uh, from a willingness to make mistakes standpoint in live. You know, the ego online is just like, uh, it's almost a driving force to make them play their best. Where in a live venue, it's almost like a dick swinging contest where people just aren't going to get out muscled. So, a weaker player might sit down and cover the table just to cover the table. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, that's that's interesting, and I think the the ideas there about the relationship between between live and online it it shows the the difference in mentality between people who who approach each game. You know, because I think one of the things that um, people sort of miss a little bit. I mean, certainly in the online tournament community, it's it's kind of that. People equate the idea of, I mean, there's there's this this whole thing about uh, pain thresholds exist with people playing tournaments and being put at risk for their tournament life as well, you know. And so, right. um, you know, people, particularly in like low to mid stakes online MTTs, I see this a lot on the TP forums. Actually, you know, anybody out there who's listening, who's a a regular on the forums, there are a lot of posts that go around saying something like, "Should I risk my tournament life in this spot? Like, should I call it off?" pre or should i call the river or something you know for my tournament life and and these are uh, mostly from players who are relatively inexperienced so in most cases they're just innocent questions about the 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 nature of a hand Uh, but the interesting thing about it is that there's this kind of idea that goes out there about being fearless in certain spots and people kind of don't necessarily understand exactly how fearless you have to be because it seems to me like it's not just being fearless in the sense of being willing to um being willing to fire a big bluff in a big pot you know it's not just being the kind of player who can bluff in big situations it's almost you have to be fearless to the point where you you literally like don't care whether you win or lose and it's almost like you have to not care so that you actually get the result that you do deep down one which is winning does that make sense is that right yeah absolutely i mean it's no different than the basic premise of gto where you're trying to get your opponent to a point of being different right right yeah i guess that's true yourself kind of need to be as well uh, mm-hmm. if you really truly believe in the strategy that you're implementing and more importantly, the spots that you're picking, mm-hmm. then you should just be very indifferent to it all. It's just like, whatever, if it doesn't work this time, I know that it's going to create a dynamic between myself and this person. And I'm going to find a way to get it back from in another, uh, kind of like outside the box angle. Right. Exactly. And it, I, I find myself doing that as well. I find myself 
in situations where I make a I make a big bluff and I'll sort of mentally congratulate myself for making a big bluff. But then when the guy's like sitting there thinking about whether to call or not, I'll be sort of mentally willing him to fold and I'll be like, no, I should I, I sort of catch myself and think, no, I shouldn't be doing that because if I know this is actually the right play, I shouldn't care whether he folds or not. Right. So it's it's kind right. of results orientated to actually be afraid of having a bluff get called. So I think that's a trap a lot of people fall into for sure. Yeah. Yeah. I do think it's fair though to like will him to fold whatever you're bluffing. You obviously want the best case scenario to happen. Yeah, I guess so. I guess so. I'm just beating myself up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And and also like, you know, uh particularly in a live setting. Uh, you are going to be pressing expo- exploits. So like mm-hmm. you you may be bluffing in a scenario where you're very bluff heavy, but it right. should just work often. Mm-hmm. And you really want it to work there because uh, you're effectively, if put in the same spot, willing to pass on a little bit of value in order to ensure that your your bluffs are going to be getting through there a lot more often. Right, yeah. And sometimes it's also a spot where like if you know that if you're – if you have to show that hand down, it's going to like kill a bunch of your EV or something, you know, or it's right. going to like completely change the whole dynamic at the table if you show down nine deuce off in some random spot. So you're like, you know, that there's more writing on it than just that hand sometimes. So it yeah, is hard yeah, to yeah. It's hard to not root for a certain thing, but it's but it's an interesting mentality to to think in terms of being fearless to the point where you're not just like willing to put in a certain amount of big blinds in the right spot, but fearless to the point where it like it doesn't even matter to you like you're, you're yeah, not yeah. even i think it's like yeah. once he calls and you just like proudly table the bluff now you're indifferent to it yeah you know, that's now, the point, you know. now your mind now your mind just immediately transitions to how is this going to affect the rest of the session and what can i do to now profit from yeah it's the- being indifferent after the fact that's the tough part you know yeah 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 right exactly and i th- i think um this is a nice little segue too because i think one of the one of the things that is most important about the idea of you know being indifferent, being indifferent, or being uh, in the right mindset emotionally is to, is to to be able to understand um, the emotional content that goes into to playing a hand of poker. And and certainly the thing that strikes me about you as a as a as a player, as a as a person as well, since I you know having read your some of your blog posts, um, you seem to be a, a I mean if if you'll allow me to to say something nice you're an outstanding yeah. communicator and writer um I, I mean i've been writing since i was 11 years old i've never seen a poker player that writes about stuff that's not poker the way that you do so first of all congratulations on that but like Thank you. I, really I i can't i can't imagine um that you would perhaps have the same instincts for um for poker if you weren't as emotionally aware to to write and communicate in that way does that does that make sense do you think that's true yeah Absolutely. Uh, I, I think it's something that like when I was younger, I probably couldn't quantify, but mm-hmm. I've always, I've always just like had this level of expression to me um, right. where I was willing to be a little more open and honest and transparent than, than others. And it definitely uh, somewhere along the line, there was a tipping point. Like uh-huh. I, I was the opposite when I first started, uh, you know, I came from a baseball background. It's a game of failure. But I was the guy who never – I was a mental midget when it came to baseball. Like I failed because uh, I could never keep my emotions in check. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, Not performing, especially with the level that I, I just loved the game and wanted to succeed at the highest levels. Every little nuanced thing that I did incorrectly just you know, held over me like – an absolute storm and it took Mm -hmm. me a long time to like get over things so i was incredibly emotional when i first started playing this game i thought i was the best obviously because just results (laughs) everyone does everyone thinks they're the best when they first start out (laughs) yeah and you know there's no rhyme or reason and uh when things stop like or start going against you uh it was just a, a big big emotional roller coaster for me the highs were incredibly high The lows were incredibly low, and that's how I was coming into college when it came to baseball. I got better at it because I worked at it. I I actually saw uh, a sports psychologist when I was in college as well, so like Mm -hmm. I knew the mental game was very important there uh, back then. Um, And I remember my first coach uh, in college just like really pushing the concept of being even killed. And in my five years of playing, I never got there. But it did lay the groundwork for like where my poker career was going to uh, travel towards. Uh, you know, I suffered through the emotional highs and lows early, but you 
just begin to develop a bit of a callus, especially like guys my age who kind of came through the boom and mm -hmm. really were just like left to figure it out all out on their own. There wasn't the level of strategy out there like there is now. Uh, we certainly had zero business acumen, so I just did everything wrong. <laughs> but fortunately, like I, I had my eyes open while I was doing it, and I learned each and every time. And it's like you start to develop uh, what was once a tremendous weakness into a massive uh, strength. And it's like I feel very comfortable now uh, seeing things from a business point of view. Like I, I know how to work a business deal. I know how to draw up a proposal. I know how to do all these things that most people require a four-year education for. And I paid hundreds of thousands of dollars for it, but I don't know that I could have learned it any other way. Um, and I think all along the way, like my emotions became more and more in check due to that callus that I was building to just the nature of the beast. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I for a long time, I think it's sort of, it's it seemed apparent to me that the process of trying to get better at poker and trying to succeed at poker is very much a, a process of, trying to succeed at life in a way in that there are a lot of things that are necessary for a poker player to do such as rem remove ego from the equation in certain situations such as be willing to to be disciplined and do things that have a long-term benefit but maybe aren't enjoyable in the short term all of that stuff like that's that's stuff that you that is it's just in a case of improving as a person in a lot of ways so i feel like a lot of poker players get held back by their insistence that improving as a poker player is all about just improving your understanding of strategy and that's it that's yep. the only thing you know because if you if you aren't willing to like examine the flaws in your own personality that might be causing certain issues in your poker game then you're kind of you have this huge blind spot and and i feel like a lot of players have that do you think that's a fair judgment yeah, absolutely. Uh, about a year and a half ago, I got to cross off uh, an item on my bucket list, and I got to go home to my alma mater and, and deliver a speech. That's and, great. Uh, I had some time to prepare for it, and I knew exactly what I wanted to do from the start because, like, the premise was, you know, coming from a small town uh, and actually like doing this off the beaten path type of career choice. What type of advice could you give? Whatever. Um, so I went heavy into researching the concept of uh, Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And for oh, yeah. those who aren't familiar, it's basically just like he, he was a, a psychologist who, or a psychiatrist, whatever, who believed that like, you know, we have basic needs and then uh, stepping up the ladder, uh, there are other uh, intangible needs that we have leading all the way to enlightenment. Um, and I think the one bit or the biggest misconception that people who are familiar with Maslow don't necessarily understand or uh, just human nature, because whether you understand Maslow's hierarchy or not, you're still applying it in everyday life. Uh, you know, right. you have your basic needs. You need to fulfill uh, food, shelter, clothing, um, you know, uh, social interaction, love from another, love for yourself, all these things, they're, they're all necessary. But what most people just don't understand is number one, if you're of sound mind, generally your basic needs are taken care of. You'll always uh -huh. find a way to survive from a food, shelter, clothing standpoint. There's just like, at least in uh, in America, like we're we're definitely in a situation where um, it's it's not the easiest thing in the world to just fall flat on your face. You know, there, mm -hmm. there's always a helping hand. Um, but beyond all that, the fact that the hierarchy is very fluid and there's never really a need to emphasize one layer of, of the hierarchy for a long duration. And the way that breaks down and translates to normal people is uh, their priorities. People think that it's a very strict linear list and that certain things will always have higher priority over others, right? Like uh, it should always be a top priority to put your family first, your friends second, uh, your job third, your leisure activities forth, whatever the case, whatever uh, people decide to linearly lay out. But when you operate that way, you you never really get to fully, uh, like, I guess, develop as a person because you just have this heightened spotlight on one area and you're just not developing enough in the others. So it ultimately, like, 
for poker players in particular, it ultimately crushes their social life. Uh, it crushes their, their physical health. In a lot of ways, it hurts their mental health because they just have such a heightened sensation on becoming very good at this game that they've chosen to pursue as a career. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Yeah, that's pretty interesting. So are, are, you, are you saying that sometimes in order to be good at poker, you have to change up your priorities or that you just are forced to change them up by the nature of the game? I, I just think in order to be like a well-rounded individual and somebody who's mentally stable through all of the shit storm that poker is going to throw your way, there has to be times where uh, you know, socializing is the number one priority. There has to be times where your physical health is your number one priority. There has to be times where the game is the number one priority. And there should be an understanding that like, you're, there is no list of priorities, right? Like, you're not obligated to do any of these things any given time of your life. However, there are going to be situations where something's going to present itself and it's going to be the number one priority in that moment. So a big game is going to come up that you're going to get invited to, and it's going to be a spot where it's too big of an opportunity to pass on. Every other priority needs to understand that that's now the number one priority for this exact moment, right? There are going to be other times where you've just like put on weight and you need to lose it. And your physical health is just going to shift to being your number one focus because it has to, and everything else should take a backseat and understand. And like, I think a lot of people traditionally view that as very selfish, right? Because if we're ever putting a game above our family or our physical health above our family or whatever the case may be, then that means that something else that is incredibly important to us is taking a back seat. But in a big reality, it's actually a very selfless act because there's nothing more selfish than forcing yourself to be cared for by somebody else. So if I'm not physically, uh, if I'm not physically taking care of myself or I'm not putting my career first, now my family has to pick up that slack and it's putting a ton of pressure on them where I could have just been quote unquote selfish and handled it myself. Right. Yeah, that makes sense. I'm, I'm curious uh, you, we had talked about the blog a little bit earlier. Is that something that you do to kind of try to keep yourself balanced? Like all the writing and stuff that you do? Um, yeah. So like, uh, I definitely like, writing the blog, uh, as a bit of an outlet, I guess. Um, but it's also just been something that I've been encouraged to like pursue. And, uh, it's, it's one of those things where, you know, we're all narcissistic and egotistical to a certain level. So like when you get that positive affirmation that you are kind of good at this thing, maybe you should try to get a little bit better at it. Uh, it, it drives, it drives me anyway, a little bit to want to, keep putting out good material. Um, and especially like, you know, I'm just incredibly open on there. So being able to be that transparent with a pretty broad audience and get mostly positive criticism back is just like a really rewarding thing for me. Uh, you know, I, I guess like there's a part of me that, that truly wants to have some sort of impact on society when it's all said and done. And I want to be more altruistic moving forward. And I think like being able to open myself up in this way is at least laying the groundwork for that. Like I might not be prepared to do anything too impactful yet, but I think that this is like kind of opening the door for me. A model that I sort of became aware of recently through a podcast called the Graves model of psychological evolution. But it's basically a, it's like an eight stage model that is a bit similar to the Maslow hierarchy of needs, but it, it, it's basically a model for individuals and societies in terms of the way that they think. And it starts out at the very bottom level with thinking in terms of pure survival. And then it moves to like a tribal mindset and then a sort of, I, I'm going to be aggressive and kind of kill all my enemies mindset. And eventually it gets to these sort of sections that are more similar to, to modern society. And the interesting thing is that you can really very easily take certain segments of society and pinpoint exactly what point in this psychological evolution they're at. And the, uh, the thing about it is it tends to, from one level to the next, it tends to flip alternately from being very self-focused to being very social focused. And the, there's one stage called the orange stage, which I think is the fifth stage. Um, and it's essentially a very, uh, it's a very modernist kind of almost super capitalist kind of 
mentality where you're very business focused and society becomes very much all about the profit motive and it and and all of this stuff and this in a lot of ways is is where a lot of parts of, of society in the states and in other countries are a lot of the time but the interesting thing about that is that's very much the way poker players are as well because everybody i mean the whole point of the game is the profit motive right so we're at, we're at that stage but then the next stage is a complete shift and a focus towards doing the best for society and the best for for everybody and the best for others so it's a shift towards selflessness and what i find really interesting is that so many poker players get through the stage where they are purely focused on how am i going to make uh, as much money as i can how am i going to be the best player that i can and then they do uh, they, I guess they do what Fedor Holtz is doing, and they basically say, okay, I'm kind of done with poker as a full-time thing. Now I'm going to focus on how to actually do some good for the planet. And it sort of seems like that maybe is the stage where you're at at this point. Does that seem accurate? Yeah, man, I have so many points to touch on on that. Um, first of all, it sounds wildly interesting to me, and I'm – It's super fascinating, yeah. yeah. I would, If you really, just Google it, you'll find a ton of stuff. It's yeah, great. Yeah, I'm definitely looking forward to look into it. Um, so I guess to work backwards and answer your question, uh, I definitely feel like I'm at that stage now, but I feel like on some level, I've kind of always been at that stage. So for most people, the most difficult thing to overcome in, in poker, at least playing professionally or well anyway, is the money factor, right? And getting over mm -hmm. the worth of it all and what you're really risking and everything else. For me, it wasn't. For me, I had to get over the empathy factor. And I just had this like, awful sinking feeling about taking other people's money uh, particularly like the last huh. minute. like i never felt bad playing against people who were well off and like you know taking what they could afford but just from the start up until like pretty far into my career it was very easy to identify the people who like just didn't belong there and where you kind of felt like you were taking advantage of them and it became really uh -huh. difficult for me to adopt the mindset of uh it's a kill or be killed type of uh, landscape. And, you know, I very, very vividly remember in through like the four, first five years of my career, just cutting people breaks and value betting thin was just like something that it wasn't that I wasn't capable of it from a skill standpoint. I wasn't capable of it from an empathy standpoint. I would just like get to mm -hmm. a level where I felt so bad. Like this poor son of a bitch doesn't know what's about to hit him. Like, <laughs> I'm, I'm just going to let him off the hook with a smaller bet here. Uh, and, you know, eventually, like, I did develop very much a killer instinct. And, uh, you know, I, I had a running joke with my friends about, like, I wasn't there to collect money. I was there to collect souls because just, like, <laughs> you just take, like, certain lines where you just, like, no, you just really tore someone's soul right out, out from underneath them. Um but yeah, I mean, that was a very difficult thing for me. And I think it's just kind of like my nature and my mindset, uh, you know, particularly coming from where I, I, I was raised and the way that I was raised and uh, just a very community like upbringing. Uh, I have a, a burning desire to like help people. And I just really see like most of life breaking down to the most fundamental level of us just all being humans interacting with one another on uh, a very like functional level where, you know, it's more about extending the helping hand than it is stepping on someone's throat. Um, yeah. So I guess like to, to answer the, the first part of your question, like I, I've definitely always had that in me at some depth. Uh, I just think like I'm exploring it much more now. Um, uh -huh. The other aspects of like what you were mentioning there is uh, just the whole concept of like, basically following a timeline of how people think, because I mm -hmm. think that's been my greatest edge from day one is the fact that I think differently. And it's something that like, it's, it's what kind of led me to doing this, uh, solve for why camp. And it's why, why I named it that, uh, you know, it's just been something that I've really wanted to shine a focus on just the whole concept of thinking differently and removing yourself from, societal norms, social norms, uh, in, in this aspect, I guess, like, um, peer norms, whatever the case may be, and just really analyzing things for what it is. And rather than solving for solving the, the problem set for how, uh, approaching it from a why centric standpoint, because 
Uh-huh. Uh, in this day and age where there's so much information available, solving solving a problem for how is just like too simplistic and uh, it's it acts as more of a band-aid because you never really get to the true knowledge as to why that solution worked. So when you approach it from the why standpoint, it's it's kind of like the concept of Rather than giving a man a fish, you teach him to fish and he's never hungry again for life. You know, it's like, sure. I can show you the answer and you understand the how, you understand how we got there. But if I show you why we took this approach, you'll be able to extrapolate it out over multitudes of similar problems that will present themselves. And that's, yeah, that's ultimately what I want to come of this. Like, right now, it's a poker academy. But I have, like, pretty big visions for me growing it into an overall brand where, uh, you know, it's applicable in a way more widespread manner. Like, uh, I, I think the, if, if I can actually get to this level where I start to move laterally off of it, the next thing I'd like to do is like solve for why nutrition and just really get a lot of good information out there to help people who are struggling with, with weight loss or living a healthy life or whatever the case may be, because it's something that I'm passionate about and I've put a lot of time and effort and study into it. And, uh, I think it can be like very helpful to a lot of people who are kind of like struggling through their process. Yeah, that, that sounds amazing. Certainly. And what's actually, what's really going to blow your mind is that that stage that you're at in terms of thinking holistically in terms of why is actually part of the model itself. So oh. that's stage seven of the eight stages. All right. Yeah. Well, great. So that is, that's stage seven and it's the first stage at which that like that's distinguished from the previous six in that that's the first stage where you become aware of the previous six stages. So each stage up to stage six, which is the kind of uh, the sort of social focus stage, um, doesn't know about the previous stages in a specific way, but it does look down on people who think that way. So like people who are very society focused look down on people who are very selfish and very sort of all about right. themselves and making money. Sure. Um, and, uh, and so on and so forth. But the, the stage seven people, um, and they, they use colors as the, the notation. I think it's the yellow stage, the, the yellow stage. Um, it's aware of the existence of the other stages and it's able to reconcile both the sort of selfish perspective and the selfless perspective in order to do things that are more beneficial in a, in a sort of grandiose kind of a full picture kind of a way. Mm-hmm. So you're actually you're still on the model. You're just one level higher than the the social focus. Maybe that could be what it is. Man, I'm so excited! You just painted me as an overachiever. <laughs> well, I don't necessarily think that um, there's that many people out there in that stage. So yeah, it's certainly something to be to be uh, pleased with if 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 you do look into it and you find that that's where you think you are. But but of course, everybody has like different percentages from different stages, or at least this is yeah. my understanding that some people have you know a certain element of themselves that's kind of uh, well, let's say like the blue stage, I think is like stage four where it's where you, you're sort of very focused on tradition and you have a certain idea about this is the way things should be. And this is the way society should work. And we've got to do what we can to keep it this way. So, right. um, there's a lot of parallels there with, you know, I mean, I don't want to get political, but can people who have conservative political views tend to be in that area of the model Yeah, yeah. and, Just um, traditional mind and you can, mindsets. Right. But and and the the weird thing is that the model works in such a way as you can have somebody who is uh, sort of politically conservative in a way that they believe that there's a way that society should work. But that person can also have elements of green and yellow, which are like the the way later stages in their personality as well. Mm -hmm. Um, And then above everything, they have the very top stage, which is turquoise, where I think the general idea is that that's kind of like almost an enlightenment stage where almost nobody gets there. You know, it's like right. human consciousness doesn't really have that level to it yet, right, right. but we think it might at some point in history you know, or in future, you know? So it's like, it's, it's a complex model, but it's, it is fascinating. So yeah, I certainly, I thought it was relevant to bring it up just since you brought up the Maslow thing. Yeah. It sounds, it sounds incredibly interesting and it kind of seems to draw a parallel to the way that I view like Elon Musk. Um, uh-huh. You know, I, I paid attention to him from a very surface level, but my roommate Dan O'Brien actually turned me on to uh, the a very long blog post that was written about him on uh, man, I can't remember the name of the blog right now, but basically it just like really transcribed like his thought processes and why he was able to like have these bigger visions, and I, I just like I guess I felt 
uh, a sense of similarity there. And it allowed me to kind of like, I don't know, be more hopeful that I actually can be impactful on some level beyond just, you know, doing the everyday mundane tasks of eating, breathing and surviving. <laughs> and winning poker pots. Yeah, yes, exactly. The, every, every, the everyday essential of a, of a poker pro, I guess. Shipping those big pots. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. yeah. Well, we've uh, we've gone almost an hour, so I guess it's almost time to wrap it up. But I did want to uh, just ask you before we go, Matt. Like, what what plans do you have for upcoming events, tournaments you're going to play, or are you just kind of back in the cash grind mode? Uh, I'm going to Florida next week. Uh, I'm going to start off playing the Poker Night in America cash game, and then I'm going to play all four of the uh, the big four. Uh, well, hopefully I don't play all four. Hopefully I just you know go deep in one of them, but. <laughs> I plan to play hard uh, for. Uh, and then after that, um, I'm just going to be kind of focusing on a lot of other side projects. Uh, I'm working on getting a uh, web show launched that will hopefully be coming out in September or October-ish. Um, I'm going to be getting back to my blog, doing the Throwback Thursday thing, uh, where I'm detailing my backstory a little bit further. And uh, I'm going to start planning for the next uh, Sulphur Y Academy that we're going to be running in December. Very cool. Well, I'll make sure and uh, drop links down in the show notes for uh, your blog, for your Twitter, uh, and all that fun stuff so that people can find information on you know how they can get more info on all that stuff. Awesome. Cool. Anything else, Matt? Other Matt? No, absolutely. Um, just <laughs> kind of trying to digest all this very high level, deep conversation we've been we've been into. It's been a it's been a fun one. Yeah, yeah. We all have we all have a lot of reading to do now when we're done. So <laughs> I uh, think we do. We've, we've we've given some homework for the TP <laughs> listeners. Yeah, <laughs> there'll be a test next week, so be ready. <laughs> cool. Well, thank you very much, Matt, for joining us, and uh, thanks to everybody out there for listening along on Mid Six Living. And we'll see you guys all back here very very soon. Take care, guys. Thanks, thanks guys. We'll see you soon. Thank you, guys.